Quebec was swallowed by darkness, yet the danger had not come from within the earth. It had come from far beyond, from the heart of the star that warms us, a storm no one could see, but everyone would feel. Invisible rivers of energy spilled into our world, slipping into wires and stone. For nine long hours, millions faced the quiet truth. Our power is never truly our own. And in that silence, the world learned how fragile its lifelines could be, how a single breath from the sun could bend and break the systems we believed unshakable. The arrival of the storm. It began with a cluster of sunspots moving slowly across the surface of the sun. Dark blemishes on the glowing sphere marked places where tangled magnetic fields twisted and fought for release. For days, astronomers tracked them, knowing these restless regions often carried hidden danger. When the sun rotated, the cluster turned directly toward Earth. And then, the eruptions came. Two powerful solar flares burst outward, brighter than anything on Earth could ever produce. Alongside them, immense clouds of plasma, coronal mass ejections, hurled billions of tons of charged particles into space. Out there, across millions of kilometers, the solar wind carried these particles with silent speed. They didn't burn or shine as they traveled, yet they carried enormous energy. To most, space looked empty. But in reality, it was filled with streams of invisible matter racing toward our planet. Earth had no way to dodge. Its magnetic field stood waiting, a shield built by the planet's spinning core. But shields can bend. Shields can strain. As the storm grew closer, it was only a matter of time before it struck. And when it did, the world would discover just how thin that protection really was. When the sky collapsed, the storm reached Earth in the early hours of March 13, 1989. It did not roar like a hurricane or shake the ground like an earthquake. Instead, it bent the invisible lines of our planet's magnetic field. Those lines compressed, twisted, and snapped back like stretched cords under sudden strain. As the particles poured in, they created electric currents high above the atmosphere. The auroras, normally silent curtains of color near the poles, flared with strange brilliance, glowing far further south than usual. Beauty and danger arrived together. But what lit the skies also crept down into the ground. Rapid changes in the magnetic field drove currents through rock, soil, and water. These currents were weak to the human body, barely noticeable, but they were strong enough to disturb the machines we depend on. In Quebec, lights began to dim. The humming of the grid faltered. Within seconds, whole cities went dark. Elevators stopped mid-floor, Heaters switched off in the cold, and radio stations fell silent. For millions, the night became a black ocean of uncertainty. And though most did not know it then, the cause was not a broken wire or failed power plant. It was the sky itself. Fragile grids. Quebec was not the only place touched by the storm, but it was the place that broke first. The province sat on an ancient shield of hard rock that stretched deep underground. That stone carried almost no conductivity, which meant the storm-driven currents could not sink harmlessly into the earth. Instead, they searched for another path. They found it in the transmission lines. The long wires that connected power plants to cities suddenly became rivers for electricity that no one had asked for. It was as though the storm itself had plugged into the grid. At first, the changes were small. A few signals flickered on control panels. Warning lights blinked. But the system was already stretched thin. Power flowed across vast distances from hydroelectric dams in the north to homes and industries in the south. 
The stability of that delicate balance depended on special equipment placed along the way. These devices, called static compensators, helped keep voltage steady. They adjusted the flow of reactive power, smoothing out the rhythm of the grid. Yet, they were never designed for chaos from the sky. One after another, seven compensators failed. Relays tripped, circuits opened, and the structure of the grid collapsed like a row of falling dominoes. Quebec plunged into darkness. The Hidden Nature of Power To understand why those failures mattered, it helps to step back and look at what electricity really is. Most of the world's grids run on alternating current. Unlike the steady push of a battery, alternating current flows back and forth, changing direction 50 or 60 times every second. That rhythm makes it easy to move electricity over long distances. But it also means power is never as simple as it looks when a light turns on or a machine hums. Beneath that steady glow is a constant exchange, a dance of voltage and current shifting together in time. Think of voltage as pressure, the push that drives energy through wires. Think of current as the flow itself, charges moving like water through a pipe. Resistance slows that flow shaping how much energy reaches its destination. And when voltage and current move in step, power flows cleanly in one direction, doing useful work. Yet grids are not filled with simple loads. Machines, motors, and electronic devices bend the rhythm. They push against it, storing bits of energy and releasing them back. That unseen back and forth creates a strange kind of burden. Power that moves, but does not work. It is called reactive power, and it waits in the background, shaping everything. The ghost currents. Reactive power is unlike the energy we normally think about. It doesn't light a bulb or heat a stove. It drifts in and out of devices, like a tide that rises and falls, but never carries anything to shore. Capacitors and inductors are the main sources of this ghost-like flow. A capacitor holds energy in an electric field and then releases it. An inductor, made from coils of wire, stores energy in a magnetic field before sending it back. Neither consumes what they take in. They only borrow and return but the grid still feels the weight of this borrowing. Transmission lines must carry every surge, even when no work is being done. Generators must produce enough current to feed not just the homes and industries that need it, but also the invisible oscillations that circle back. In small amounts, it is harmless, even necessary, but in great volumes, it strains the network. Wires heat, transformers buzz, and margins shrink. Power appears to vanish and reappear like a ghost moving through the veins of the system. People at home never notice. Their meters track only the real power they use. Yet behind the walls, behind the switches, these unseen currents shape the stability of everything, the balance of the grid. The grid is more than wires and towers. It is a living balance where every rise in demand must be met by a rise in supply, and every sudden drop must be answered just as quickly. Real power keeps the lights on, but reactive power holds the system together. Engineers use a simple measure to understand this balance, the power factor. When voltage and current move in perfect step, the factor is high and the grid is efficient. When they slip apart, the factor falls, and more current must flow to do the same work. The system weakens, even if no one notices at home. This imbalance shows up in another way, too, through what is called the PV curve. It marks the relationship between how much power reaches a load and the voltage that supports it. Push the system too far, and the line bends toward collapse. Beyond a certain point, 
no matter how much more power is generated, less and less actually arrives. It is a cliff hidden inside the numbers. Stay on one side, and the grid runs steady. Cross it, and the structure falls apart. That is why reactive power is never just background noise. It is the quiet hand steering everything. Defenses and failures. To guard against imbalance, engineers built tools that could give or take reactive power as needed. Some were great spinning machines, synchronous condensers, turning freely without driving anything, yet stabilizing the grid with their stored momentum. Others were banks of capacitors, sitting quietly on poles or in substations, ready to push voltage upward when demand grew heavy. The most advanced were static VAR compensators. Using fast electronic switches, they blended capacitors and inductors together, adjusting instantly to keep the voltage steady. Quebec relied on them more than most. Its power had to travel vast distances from dams in the north to cities in the south, and those long lines consumed stability. But the solar storm gave no warning. Strange currents slipped into the lines, distorting signals in ways the equipment had never been trained to recognize. One by one, the compensators tripped, not to help, but to protect themselves from damage. With them offline, the grid sagged. Voltage fell, frequency rose, and control vanished. In less than a minute, the system unraveled. Quebec was left in the dark, not because of a fault inside its wires, but because the defenses built to protect it could not face the storm above. A blackout is more than the loss of light. It is the silence of machines, the pause of cities, the reminder that all our progress rests on fragile threads. In 1989, Quebec learned how easily those threads could be shaken by a storm born millions of kilometers away. The sun gives us warmth, but it can also remind us of our limits. As we lean more on renewable energy and vast grids that tie our lives together, the same truth remains. Stability is not guaranteed. Power is borrowed, and it can always be taken back.